Order. Um, it's time now for questions to the Minister of Health, and we will start with listed questions. I advise the House that questions 6 and 13 have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Edwin Poots. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. The Public Health Agency is currently delivering a Be Cancer Aware campaign to improve the public's awareness of signs and of symptoms of cancer. As part of the campaign, the Public Health Agency undertook a specific ovarian cancer awareness program in September 2014 in partnership with Target Ovarian Cancer and Angels of Hope, a local charity. This entailed the widespread distribution of leaflets and posters to highlight the signs and symptoms of the illness. The leaflets and posters were distributed to hairdressing salons, bingo halls, pharmacies and GP practices. They helped raise awareness of the signs and the symptoms, in particular among young women, among women over the age of 50, and encouraged women to speak to their GP if they, if they experience any of these symptoms. The Public Health Agency also worked with the late Una Crudden to produce a video calling on women to read the leaflets and to make themselves aware of the symptoms of ovarian cancer. The agency has also developed a Be Cancer Aware website which provides information about signs and symptoms of a range of cancers including ovarian cancer and explains what people can do if they are concerned including signposts to recommended sources of support. Public awareness of the signs and symptoms of cancer is a key factor in detecting cancers early and increasing the chances of successful treatment and survival. Raising awareness therefore could potentially have the greatest impact both in terms of patient numbers and in tackling cancer in areas of deprivation where their survival has historically been poorest. Prevention and early intervention is very much in keeping with my vision of delivering together. We need to support people to keep well in the first place and when they need the care and support, services should be safe and of the highest quality. The Public Health Agency is reviewing available evidence from other cancer awareness campaigns to help inform the next phase of the Be Cancer Aware programme. However, specific cancer sites are yet to be decided for the next phase of the programme. Call Mr. Poots, supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, welcome to the Minister's uh, clarification. Uh, Una Crudden and Angels of Hope have done tremendous work in terms of raising awareness of ovarian cancer, and uh, generally uh, known as a silent killer. Um, what importance does the Minister actually place on ensuring um, that the, what was desired by, by the late Una Crudden? in terms of uh, a campaign which, which uh, was specific to ovarian cancer. Um, how, how, what is her position on that? Uh, does she intend to, to actually have a full-blown ovarian cancer awareness campaign as opposed to integrating it with other cancers? Minister. Um, obviously, put on record, um, Una McCrudden was an amazing woman and used her um, own difficult circumstances to highlight the, the issue of ovarian cancer for other women and um, obviously um, commend her for that. I had the pleasure of meeting her in the past and um, an absolute lovely lady. And I think quite often the public are more maybe tend to listen more whenever they're actually listening to a real human story and actually someone's um, cancer journey and how they um, dealt with their with their own cancer and their their illness. Um, can I say that um, I'm not I don't have a closed mind to the idea of uh, an ovarian cancer specific campaign, but I think it's important that we analyse how effective the previous work that has been done in relation to awareness how effective that's been and that we make sure that we target um, our resources to make sure we reach the, the largest number of people possible because I believe that I really believe in early intervention and prevention I believe that we need to do more in relation to the public health agenda so whenever it comes to reviewing um, how effective those campaigns are then I'm very happy to uh, look at where we can have the greatest impact both in terms of a set of patient numbers and in tackling cancer in areas of deprivation where survival has historically been the poorest so it's not ruled out but I'm happy to um, correspond with the member as we develop just what's the next stage of the awareness campaign. Thank you. I call Joanne Dobson. Mr Speaker, I also remember well and pay tribute again to the personal crusade of Una Crudden as we approach the second anniversary of her death. Um, Minister, you'll be aware of the facts of the more aggressive cancers, but what assurances can you provide us that new drugs developed here in Northern Ireland will be made available to local patients diagnosed with ovarian cancers? Minister. Well, I think the member is referring probably to the Cancer Drugs Fund, which exists in, in England. And obviously, we have our own processes here in the north through the individual fund and request process, which exists to enable access to specialist drugs whose clinical and cost effectiveness has not been fully established. Um, I think we all realise that the current process has flaws and 
it should be less cumbersome and a bit more transparent, I think, in relation to access to it. So officials are currently working with the clinicians, who obviously have the expertise, to develop a, a new individual funding um, request process. And that new process is going to ensure that um, any individual funding requests are clinically assessed and scrutinised by a regional committee to give assurances that clinical judgment and patient care are at the heart of the process. It will also, I believe, improve access to these drugs, provided that there is a compelling clinical case. I think we have to always be aware that reforming the individual funding process, uh, a request process, and increasing access to drugs not fully endorsed by NICE will carry a significant cost at a time, obviously, whenever the health and social care budget is facing real pressures. But let's be very clear, all cancer drugs that have been recommended by NICE for routine use in the health service are available here in the north. It's only those that have not been recommended by NICE where um, patients would be asked to use the IFR, the individual funding re request process. Um, so my predecessor established that clinically led task and finish group to reform the process and went out to consultation. So I aim to introduce the new arrangements during the 16-17 on a phase basis. So um, over the next number of months, we'll have the new process rolled out. But for me, it has to be transparent. People need to know how to access the, the, the help that they need. Thank you. I call Ian Millen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. And uh, I would like to ask the Minister, thanks, thank her first for her answers thus far. Uh, what impact is the current uh, Be Cancer Aware campaign having? Minister. Well, a, a range of um, topics are covered in the campaign evaluation, including um, awareness of cancer advertising and symptoms, and knowledge and recognition of the relevant campaign material. The aim is to look at changes in recognition and knowledge between pre- and post-campaign interviews. For each Be Cancer Aware campaign targeted cancer site, lung, bowel and breast, there is a comprehensive evaluation process that's covering a number of different indicators and together that gives us a detailed picture of the potential campaign effects. Examples of the indicators used in the Be Cancer Aware evaluation are how do the campaign reach individuals, public awareness of the signs and symptoms of cancer, the number of people being referred urgently for suspe suspected cancer by GPs and the proportion of urgent referrals which result in a cancer diagnosis. Evaluations have shown that each campaign phase has had a good campaign reach through the population. Other important measures of campaign outcomes include the stage of disease and diagnosis and survival rates, and data for these indicators take much longer to come through and are not yet available. Okay, I call Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, the Minister, for her answers thus far. Last year, a report by the charity Target Ovarian Cancer highlighted that women here in the North have the worst survival rates and indeed the worst chance of having access to a clinical trial than elsewhere on these islands. Is this still the case? Minister. I think in relation to comparison rates with, for example, England, then we don't perform as, as well as England. I'm not sure about the South. Um, I'm happy to provide that um, detail to the member. But suffice to say, I think that whenever it comes to awareness, we have to do everything we possibly can in relation to awareness campaigns, whether that be for ovarian cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, or any of the other um, cancers. I think it's important that we reach as many people as possible and that we drive home that um, early intervention, early detection message, because we all know that if people are, um, if they're discovered, cancer is discovered earlier, then their chances of um, survival and getting support are obviously great, a lot higher. So in relation to the, the specific stats, I'm happy to write to the member with, with those, but just to, to, to put on record, I will make sure that we thoroughly review the impact of the campaigns we've had to date and make sure that whenever it comes to future um, campaigns that we targeted at those areas where we, we absolutely can make a massive difference. Thank you. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It was my privilege to present a thousand strong petition uh, to Edwin Putz in his time as Health Minister for a targeted standalone ovarian cancer awareness campaign, not least because of the vital importance of early diagnosis and accurate GP referral. At the time, we were told that being part of the B Cancer Awareness Campaign would can be the, the, question, the approach please? to take. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, in her review of whether being part of the B Cancer Awareness Campaign rather than a targeted standalone campaign was the best approach, and would she be willing to meet with a deputation of women affected uh, by ovarian cancer to include them in that review? Minister. Yeah, in relation to the review work that happens across the PHA, I'm quite sure they would be very happy to meet with the women who, who have been impacted and actually know um, how it is to, to go through an ovarian cancer diagnosis. Um, I'm, I'm very happy. My door is open in relation to engaging with individuals. I just think it's important that if we're going to have awareness campaigns, that we target them where we can make the best effect. So whether that be as a standalone campaign or whether it be as part of the Be Cancer Aware, then look, I'm open for that, for that conversation. 
We move on. I call Mr. Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, question number two, please. Minister. Following a full public consultation in 2014 about the future provision of hospital services for older people, the Southern Health and Social Care Trust's long term plan is that all inpatient care will be delivered at Craigavon area and Daisy Hill hospitals. However, it was acknowledged that the transfer of inpatient services from Lone House on the South Throne Hospital site would be dependent on the Trust securing the necessary capital investment for construction of a new unit on the Craigavon area hospital site. So, therefore, there are no immediate plans for the closure of Lone House. As set out in the Health and Wellbeing 2026, Delivering Together, my department and I will work with the wider HSE system to design new partnership approaches to the planning and management of HSE services. I want the new model of person-centred care to be designed in collaboration with people and communities to be focused on what services people need and how they can be provided most effectively, rather than the buildings in which, in which they are provided. The way we design and deliver services will be focused on providing continuity of care in an organised way and will increasingly involve working across traditional organisational boundaries. Uh, Mr McPhillips, supplementary. I thank you, the Minister for her answer. There is a new £450 million uh, build hospital confirmed for Craigavon. How does this fit in with Ben Goa and the Minister's vision for health and social care in that region? Minister. Well, the Southern Trust has identified the redevelopment of Craigavon Area Hospital site as one of their key capital projects, and the department recognises that it is a priority project. However, there are a number of other similar large-scale priority projects across the HSC, which will also require significant levels of funding. So plans for a new build are currently with the department for consideration, so we're actively looking at those. The key drivers for the project are the condition of the existing estate and the growing population and associated hospital activity. The capital costs for phase one of the new build are over £450 million. Pounds. So a decision on the progression of this project will be considered alongside other capital investment priorities and will be further dependent upon budgetary availability, value for money and affordability. However, given the level of commitments we currently have in 1718 and 1819, this cannot be funded without substantial additional capital resource. And obviously I'm involved in the budget 2017 process and that's going to be expected to conclude by the end of this year. So whilst this priority um, project for the redevelopment of, of Craig Avon. I think it's important that uh, we continue to look at everything now in the context of delivering together and how we're going to transform health and social care and that certainly would be part of my key considerations in terms of future services no matter that being in the Southern Trust area or any other trust area. Thank you. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, concerns are growing in the Western Trust that services will be downgraded in one of its hospitals to increase provision in the other. Can, can you give a commitment that the Bengoa reconfigurations will not merely be used as a convenient smokescreen to move stroke services from the southwest acute to Elton Galvin? Thank you, Emma, for your question. And the member will know I'm also a rural MLA and I'm very um, conscious of the needs of rural people and making sure um, that we, the people have full access to services on, on an equal basis. Bengoa and Delivering Together is, is not about um, withdrawing services, it's about reforming our health and social care system, it's about delivering better health outcomes for individuals and there's a lot of potential there I think for services um, to be delivered in, in some of the Western Trust sites and indeed many other sites. So I think that when we look towards the future we should be looking towards the opportunities that are there. Um, I'm certainly looking towards that because I think the conversation we all need to be having is about how do we deliver better health and social care for all of our, of our population. So that's certainly what I'm wedded to. But I think that um, nobody should scaremonger or, or, or run ahead of ourselves. What I've said is I am going to listen to staff. I am going to listen to patients. I am going to design services with those people. So there won't be any surprises. All the decisions that will be taken in terms of where we deliver services in the future will be taken with full public consultation, with taken on board from the very outset, not just as a, as a tick box exercise or as a, a consultation mechanism further down the line. From the outset, I will involve all those people in terms of how we reconfigure services. And the key goal and the key prize for me is better health and social care for everybody. Thank you. I call Michelle Gildernew. Of Las Kincorla. The Minister is all too aware of just how busy the South Throne site is. Can she um, maybe expand on how she sees South Throne Hospital fitting in with your approach on, uh, as outlined in Delivering Together, please? Yeah, and as I said, I think it's too early to say what services will be provided in any individual hospital, but I do expect that the potential of South Throne Hospital will be fully explored as the trans transformation process goes forward. So I think that, again, there are opportunities. You're absolutely right, South Throne Hospital currently provides a whole range of services to the local population, 
and is an excellent example of a flexible and resilient local hospital. In addition, <coughs> in addition to the 45 bed inpatient rehabilitation unit at Lone House, South Throne Hospital has a 15 place day hospital for elderly patients. It has a rapid access clinic, provides care for older people referred by their GP who need to be seen within 24 to 72 hours but aren't acutely ill and don't need to be admitted to hospital. South Throne Hospital has the largest minor injuries unit which sees more than 26,000 patients a year, giving it a vital role in providing care locally and reducing some of the pressure on the larger emergency departments. The hospital provides day surgery and diagnostics including CT scanning and a range of output clinics, outpatient clinics and allied health professional services. The hospital is also the base for many of the community care services and specialist teams which help people to be cared for in their own homes and in the community as far as possible, including the community stroke team, community diabetes team, acute care at home team, community palliative care team, adult mental health teams and the area's health visitor and social work team. So a very busy hospital indeed and I said in terms of going forward the potential exists for South Stone Hospital to do more and I'm currently undertaking a whole process of engagement with stakeholders right across health and social care to build a collective view about how our health and social care services should be configured in the future. Thank you. We move on. I call Mr Steve Aiken. Number three, please. Latest provisional, latest provisional information indicates that at the 31st of October 2016, the number of people waiting longer than 18 weeks for a consultant-led outpatient appointment in Antrim Area Hospital has increased by 1,382 compared to the same period last year. Currently 777 people are waiting more than 52 weeks. In order to minimise the impact on patients, the Health and Social Care Board continues to work with trusts to maximise the delivery of funded capacity and ensure the application of good waiting list management practice, including assessing and treating urgent cases first and thereafter seeing and treating patients in chronological order. I am firmly of the view that the current waiting lists are unacceptably long. However, unless we tackle the root causes, this will remain to be the case. As we have a 20th century model delivering services for a 21st century population, this is having an increasingly negative impact on the quality and experience of care. The long-term solution is the transformation of our health and social care system, as outlined in Delivering Together. It's only in transforming the health and social care system and by implementing new models of care that we will be able to alleviate the pressures on our health and social care services, sustain improvements in waiting times and deliver better outcomes for patients. That said, I wish to pay uh, tribute to staff right across HSE. In the first half of this year alone, there have been over 240,000 consultant-led outpatient appointments and nearly 89,000 admissions for inpatient day case treatment. Notwithstanding the structural issues, they continue to work incredibly hard to deliver the best possible service to patients. Thank you. Uh, Mr Aiken for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, in view of those awful figures that we're hearing from Antrim Area Hospital, could the Minister, given the recent media reports on the lengthening of waiting list times, explain how massaging targets to match the poor performance of our department is beneficial to the near quarter of a million cases on our waiting lists. I'm not interested in massaging anything. I'm interested in making sure that people get seen in the most timely manner, that they get the health and social care that they deserve when they need it. So that's, that's my priority in terms of um, being the health minister. We have, um, what I clearly said is that we need to transform health and social care. That's the reason we're, de we're de trying to deliver 21st century health and social care with a 20th century system, which is out of date and can't keep up with the rising demand. We have a rising demand, we have more people being seen, but obviously people are living longer, more complex conditions, it makes it all very difficult. So we have short term initiatives and we have longer term initiatives. In the longer term, let's transform health and social care and I want to work with all the parties in this house to be able to deliver that because if we don't do that, we'll be having this conversation for, for many, many, many years to come. In the short term, I'm about making sure that my department does absolutely everything that it can. It's about maximising the delivery of the commission volumes that a trust are um, commissioned to deliver. It's about continuing to prioritise patients by clinical urgency. It's about chronological management of non-urgent patients. It's about using the dedicated schedule of staff to manage the patient pathways. It's about overtime clinics. It's about a whole range of issues. And I've identified £4 million to invest in elective care over the next number of months. Um, to allow us to actually do more than reaching an additional 10,000 people. So that shows the executive's commitment to dealing with waiting lists. I've said I'm going to publish my plan in January in relation to elective care and to set out targets as to how we're going to deal with waiting lists. But let's be very clear, we didn't inherit this problem. I didn't inherit this problem. It didn't happen overnight. This has been a result of cuts to the block grant year on year by the Tory government. It's been about their austerity policies. And we have to... 
and you can laugh all you want, but your friends and the Tories cut, cut, cut the executive's block grant year on year and made it really, really difficult. And when I were in the position we're in because of that. So I'll not be found wanting in terms of my approach to dealing with waiting lists. I will do absolutely everything I can. I continually come to this House and I continually say everything that I'm doing. And I will continue to do that because I just want the public to get the message loud and clear. I am doing absolutely everything I can to bring the waiting list down. And I think the public will thank us for that. And that's what they should judge us on. Uh, call Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, earlier this month, the government parties voted against our motion on waiting lists because they said that, in fact, the figure referred to cases and not to people. Um, going by the old figures, it may, may, may very well have referred to people. Do we know how many humans are actually waiting uh, based on the old targets? Minister. I'm not quite sure if you understand the question, but in relation to the, the figures that you refer to, it's very important that when we had a recent debate, people were just adding up X, Y and Z, as opposed, and, and clearly this, whenever we publish the stats it says don't do that, don't take that approach because that's not a, not an appropriate figure. So in relation to the, the figures which I highlighted in the answer, the figures are very clear in terms of um, what I said to Mr Aiken in relation, but they're in relation to the Northern Trust only. I think it's important that the public understand, not that they understand, that they have confidence in the fact that we're doing everything we can. We'll have to transform health and social care, that's the reality, that's the longer term plan, but in the meantime. People can't wait till we get to the point where our health service is transformed. So I've set out all the things that I'm doing. I want to bring waiting lists down. They are totally unacceptable to me. I'm happy to be questioned day on daily in relation to what I'm doing. I will bring forward the plan in January, which is very clearly set out how we're going to do that. But we have to transform. We have to bring in ambulatory clinics. We have to bring in assessment centres. We have to do so much more, and we have to do it in speed. Well, Catherine Seeley. Minister, she mentioned the root causes of long waiting times. Can I ask the Minister uh, how she hopes to address those root causes? Yeah, as I said, waiting times are a product of increased pressure on the health service and demand is going to continue to grow year on year because we have an ageing population. We have emergence of new technologies and changes in practice in healthcare. These factors are not going to go away and we need to consider how we're going to deal with them in a way that delivers the best outcome for patients and which is sustainable in the long term. The long-term solution is the transformation I've set out in Delivering Together, and we need to move to a population health model, and we need to create a more sustainable service, one that makes the best use of the resources we have to deliver the best possible services to patients. Key areas of innovation that we're considering for the plan, subject obviously to securing the required investment, include the further development of ambulatory assessment and treatment centres, which will allow patients to be assessed, diagnosed, and if required, receive a treatment or procedure all in one day. I recently visited similar facilities in the Royal Victoria and also in the Matter, and I was impressed to see the positive impact that they have on the experience for patients and for staff. Elective care centres will also be established for less complex plan treatment, and the centres will be a resource for the region, and the way they operate will be designed around patients. So put simply, they will allow clinicians to see and to treat more patients. I call Paula Bradshaw. Really, Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you for your answers so far. I, I, I'm concerned about the emotional welfare of those people sitting on, on the waiting list and I would like you to tell me about how people are being communicated and updated on it and also if they're getting access to emotional or counselling or, or um, therapeutic support while they're waiting because I think the anxiety and the not knowing can sometimes have a detrimental effect on their health. Yes, well, I would encourage anybody who's sitting on a waiting list and has been waiting for a very long time, if their condition is worse than they need to contact their GP again and it's up to the GP then obviously um, referring to the hospital services and to prioritise that patient and ensure that the consultant that they're waiting to see knows that they're now, their needs have changed. That's a process that's ongoing and we're asking GPs to continually do that. So anybody who's sitting for a very long time on the list, if your condition's worsened, go and see your GP. I absolutely understand if you've been waiting for a very long period of time, whether it be for yourself or your children or your parents or anyone else in your family, it's so frustrating. It, it is annoying because you're worried about your health and what does it mean for you in the future. So we have to do everything we can. That's, that's, that, that's my focus. It's about absolutely bringing down the waiting list as, as quickly as we possibly can. And it's about transforming health and social care. Um, I'm not aware of any particular initiatives in relation to emotional support or wellbeing, but anybody again who's concerned about that should, could, should go back and speak to their GP. Thank you. I, uh, we move on. I call Daniel McCrossan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, a question for Minister. Minister. As is clear from my many public statements, robust action continues to be taken in relation to this issue. 
To begin with, I have confirmed that increased investment of three million in adult community learning disability services is now in place, and a further five million is planned by the Western Trust. I have also met again with representatives of local families and carers and have subsequently spoke with the Chief Executive of the Trust to relay the concerns of families and of carers and to make clear my expectation that progress is now made on the development of a new investment plan that has the backing of the families. To support this, I proposed at a meeting that I had with families in October that an independent facilitator should be appointed to work with the Trust and the families to restore trust and confidence following the recent breakdown in relationships. <laughs> This work will be taken forward in the context of the wider communication and engagement plan, and I have also asked the Trust to develop this. Furthermore, I have also appointed a senior official from my department to oversee progress and to act as a point of contact for the families. These actions mark my commitment to finding a co-designed resolution to this issue and to working with the families and the Trust so that the focus can return to the delivery of much-needed frontline services on the ground for people with a learning disability and for their families. I believe that we all share this focus and I am determined to do all that I can to ensure that it is realised. Uh, Mr McCrossan, supplement. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the answer uh, uh, and uh, for your attention on this issue for a long number of months. It has been going on nine months. Can the Minister now confirm to this House that she has gotten to the bottom of this uh, uh, issue? Uh, what is the overall figure and who was at fault uh, uh, for this uh, scandal within the Trust? Yes, well, um, the member will be aware that we have, based on the financial data that's been provided by the Health and Social Care Board, that the average capitation variance relating to the funding of adult and community learning disability services in the West Trust has been quantified at around £7 million per annum. However, to be clear, a capitation variance of this type does not necessarily mean there has been an underspend, but I think given that it's a complicated um, calculation and capitation is complicated, one thing that I promised the um, the group, whenever I met them recently, was that they would give them a meeting with the board so they actually could go through it all and actually understand for themselves um, exactly how it's worked out. So they, they're, they're glad, glad to take up that opportunity. And I think that would be important just for, to help everybody to understand what is a complex subject. Um, that I think it's something that they, they certainly uh, were grateful for that to happen. So I've asked officials to arrange a meeting between the, the, the group and the Health and Social Care Board who are carrying out a, re a review of the Learned Disability Capitation Model. I call Michaela Boyle. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far? And also, I want to thank the Minister for her involvement with uh, the families and the work that she's done with the families and indeed Waldag and others in relation to this uh, matter. Minister, can you give us an update on the progress in terms of uh, appointing an independent facilitator? Um, to, to address the underspend and maybe provide a timeline for that. Yeah, I met with the Western Learning Disability Action Group and the South West Cures Forum on the 11th of October to hear directly about their concerns following the, what we all know now to be a breakdown in relationships between them and the Trust. And at that meeting I had agreed a number of um, actions including that I would give consideration to the appointment of an independent person to support a process of co-production between the Trust and the local families and carers to develop a plan for how the planned five million investment will be spent. I think this is a practical example of partnership and co-design approach which I'm very keen to promote. I recently wrote to the groups representing the families for their comments on the draft terms of reference for that independent facilitation and they've just recently gotten back to me and I'm considering their comments and I plan to respond to them very shortly. The one key message I took from the meeting with, with both groups was that they want to get on with making sure that they have the best possible services available to their families and they want to get on and be part of the process of designing services. So in order I think for us to be able to do that confidently we need to build up that trust again. So I believe the independent facilitator is the mechanism that allows us to be able to build those relations again to give these people confidence that um, the trust are putting their needs first and foremost and I think that the whole process of co-production exactly how I'm saying we need to be developing services in the future. So I think they've got an opportunity now to actually um, lead the way in terms of um, producing, the, um, producing the services and um, designing the services together. Tom Buchanan. Thank, you and thank the Minister again for her response to this and thank the Minister for what she's been doing on this up until uh, this moment in time. But will the Minister give an undertaking that she will ensure that the families are kept to the forefront of this process going forward uh, so that they will feel part of it and that uh, the, the delivery will come uh, for them? Let's remember they're the people that have suffered through this and they're the people that have had the concerns. 
Minister, briefly, please. I can absolutely give that assurance. That's what it's about. It's about designing the service with them. The reason I put in the independent facilitator was to build that tr trust again, because the confidence and, and the trust had completely broken down. So I think that there's a job of work to be done there, and I think the only way we we're going to be able to successfully achieve that is with independent facilitation. So I think that that's, that's the way to go, and I think that will ensure that everybody's involved in the decision-making and the processes for going forward. Order that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Joanne Dobson. Dear Deputy Speaker, Minister, this morning you accused me of, and I quote, misrepresenting the figures around ambulance turnaround times. What is your assessment on the impact on patients of 7,973 ambulances taking longer than an hour to turn around at hospitals in the last year? Well, during October 2016, almost half of ambulances arriving at hospitals were turned around within 30 minutes of arrival, and 95% within one hour. This is against a background of increasing demand for ambulance services. In 2015-16, the ambulance service answered 202,325 emergency calls, an increase of 5.5% on the previous year. Improved patient handover and ambulance turnaround times remains a priority for the health and social care. The Ambulance Service is working with the Board and the Trust to improve turnaround times at all hospital sites. Turnaround times at Type 1 emergency departments are monitored very closely on a live basis and appropriate action is taken by the Ambulance Service to ensure that waiting times are kept to a minimum. Call Joanne Dobson, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, the original question was around the time taken to hand over a patient at the emergency care department. Your response to me says information is not available. Given that this data is collected in other jurisdictions, why is this not the case in Northern Ireland? I think we all can share the desire that patients are transferred as soon as possible, but the overriding factor has to be about patient safety and making sure that patient is not compromised. So if the handover takes a bit longer, then that's what should happen if it makes the patient safer. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sorry for that. I think that's, that's the right thing to do. The ambulance crew will remain with the patient until they've been handed over to the relevant clinician, the clinical person within the hospital and can alert the emergency department staff if a patient's condition worsens. I answered the member's question, but I do think that the member has a tendency quite frequently to run away with herself and make, try to make a cheap headline out of a story for the day. But really and truly, I'm only interested in delivering excellent patient health outcomes. That's, that's, that's at the core of everything I do is about delivering patient outcomes. I'm not interested in cheap headlines. I'm interested in doing a job. I call Justin McNulty. The Minister may be aware that the only remaining senior emergency department consultant at Daisy Hill Hospital in Newry is due to retire just a few weeks away. The post is yet to be filled, despite the Trust advertising three times. Can the Minister tell me what steps her department has taken to ensure permanent emergency consultants are recruited to fill the vac vac vacancies in Daisy Hill and not, there's no cheap headline intended? Minister. Um, I understand and, and I'm aware of the problems which the Southern Trust have had in terms of trying to recruit um, and ha despite having been out three times, find it really, really difficult. So we're looking at additional measures to allow us to actually make the post more attractive and, and you will be very aware that the Daisy Hill service has been very wholly dependent on, on one doctor who has been providing excellent service there and your idea is about to retire. So I can assure you that the Trust is doing absolutely everything I can to make sure the doors are kept open and the services are still provided. Um, if we have to use locums in, in the meantime then that is what we will have to do but it is about delivering services. It's, it, I suppose it is reflective of the challenges we have right across the health and social care workforce. We are finding it very, very difficult to re recruit consultants, particularly for emergency departments. So we have to look at new and innovative ways of actually attracting people to these posts. Mr McNulty, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her response. Uh, Minister, the emergency department at Dizzy Hill is a valuable service to, look, to the local community. It is imperative that we retain the facility and that we retain acute hospital status. Will the Minister give me and the people of Newry and the surrounding area a categorical guarantee that Daisy Hill will retain its 24 hours a day, seven days a week emergency department for many years to come? Minister. Well, I think it would be foolish of me to stand up here and say nothing will ever change. I couldn't say that to any member of this House. If we are serious about transforming health and social care, then we will have to be serious about um, how we de deliver that care. So I am very open to looking at uh, and designing services with staff with patients, with locally elected representatives, because I think we're going to have to have some hard conversations. Because we're standing here having a conversation about waiting lists, 
and we have to change the picture in relation to waiting lists. We have to see people quicker. We have to bring the waiting list down. So in order to do that, we're going to have to transform how we deliver health and social care. We can't keep doing things the same way. So I could never give a cast iron guarantee to anybody, and it would be irresponsible of me to do so. But what I will give a guarantee is that I will work every day to deliver better health outcomes for individuals. I will, if I have to redesign services anywhere, I will do it in conjunction with local rep rep representatives, with patients, with staff. I, mean, I think that's the difference which we've never seen before in relation to the health service. So my guarantee to the people of Newry is that I will deliver, and Daisy Hill, who used that hospital, I will deliver first class health and social care for each and everybody who needs it. I call Steve Aiken. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker and the Minister. Uh, Minister, this is not a cheap, but it's a very sad headline. It's been over six weeks since the working group on fetal fetal abnormality completed its work. When will the report be published? Minister. The Justice Minister and I received the working group of the fetal fetal abnormality on the 11th of October. The First Minister and Deputy First Minister have now seen the report, and the Justice Minister and I will continue to work closely on the matter, and we hope to bring forward proposals early in the new year. Mr. Aiken. Uh, Minister, many people are now calling out the establishment of this working group for what it was, a political whitewash that provided a convenient escape for the DUP when they needed one. Will the Minister try to restore some of the rapidly waning confidence in this report by at least giving us an anticipated time scale? How long will it take her and the Justice Minister and the Executive to be able to form an opinion? We Thank would you. be very interested to hear. Well, I was very interested in the work of the working group. I think it was a very important piece of work in so far as that it sought the views of women and their families who have been directly impacted by a diagnosis of fatal, fatal abnormality, and that had to be a core element of the work that the group did. Um, I very much welcome the input which they have provided, and I want to take an opportunity to thank them because I appreciate what they have done. And I also appreciate the upset that lies behind their own personal experiences, so it's not easy to share your own personal um, story. So I, I believe that the, the work has been invaluable. The group also sought views of health professionals, including midwives, gynaecologists, nurses, GPs, um, and the Royal Colleges. And it also took into account the views of other interested parties who responded to the recent justice um, consultation on the matter of fatal, fatal abnormality. The time frame I've said, I, we will bring um, proposals forward um, early in the new year. So we're, we're almost at the end of the year now. So early in the new year, now that the First and Deputy First Minister have also had sight of the report, we collectively will work on it. But I will be bringing, I will be bringing, I will be bringing forward proposals, uh, can call you in the new year. I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, Speaker, uh, I wonder would the Minister confirm to me uh, what she would consider to be a satisfactory time for ambulance response in Bangor on Saturday afternoon past? Minister. Can call you. I don't think I could answer that. Mr. Chambers, supplementary. I can help the Minister then. Uh, would the Minister uh, consider it acceptable uh, that one of my constituents, an 87 year old man with a pre existing heart condition who collapsed in Bangor Leisure Centre on Saturday and displaying all the symptoms of a heart attack and had to wait 45 minutes for a first responder to attend? And indeed, the member of staff who made the 999 call had to wait for nearly 10 minutes in a queue because of the, the high volume of calls. Would the minister find that acceptable? Minister. Can I wish the individual well and hope that they're recovering? No, I don't find it acceptable that if the ambulance didn't get there in time to support the individual. So if the member wants to write to me in relation to the individual issue or take it up with the ambulance trust, I'm very happy for, for that to happen. But let's be very clear about our ambulance staff and personnel. They're doing everything they can. They're working in difficult situations. I referred earlier to uh, the figures which we had were um, almost um, in relation to the target and the, how the ambulance service are delivering. But they're under a lot of pressure. They're delivering or responding to more calls. So I don't think it's acceptable if someone had to wait longer than, than they should for their, for their care. But again, I'm very happy to take on board what the member has raised with me. And if he wants to send me an email or write to me about it, then that, that I'm very happy to receive that. I call Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> or sorry, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline what our plans are for a new health hub in Limavati so that all existing services, including car parking and full out of hours provision, will be located in a single site? Minister. I don't have um, the detail in relation to that, but I'm happy to write to the member and to give you more detail in relation to the future plans. Supplementary, mm. Mr. Robinson. Thank you. Will the Minister give a commitment to prioritise this vital project in the rural area and area of high deprivation 
if she, if she secures the necessary funding. Minister. Well, fair play to the member for fighting the corner of the area in which he's elected, and rightly so. Um, I, I consider all projects, capital projects, I'm not sure where it is in relation to the, the trust capital priority list, but I'm happy to take a look at that and respond to the member and write in relation to, to where it sits. But I'm a big believer in investing in primary care. I think we do need to build services in our communities. I think if we're going to transform health and social care, take the focus out of hospitals, then we'll have to be investing in our communities. And that's very much at the core of what I'm trying to do with Delivering Together. Question number six, the name of Pam Cameron, has been withdrawn. Uh, Mr Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers today. Following on from the comments you made earlier in relation to the rural community, maybe could the Minister, and particularly in light of the recent publication of Bengoa and also her vision. Could the Minister maybe detail how the Rural Needs Act, Northern Ireland 2016, will be implemented during the process of transformation, particularly how that will then be impacted in regards to rural communities? Minister. Yeah, well, the member will know that I brought that legislation forward, and so I'm very passionate about it. So I'll make sure that everything we take in terms of decision making will be rural proofed and we'll, we'll apply the, the legislation. But even more so than that, I want to go right into the heart of communities. If we're going to be transforming services, we need people to understand why. We need to get them on board. It needs to be, I suppose, there needs to be full understanding that this is about not stripping services from anybody. It's about how can we invest more in our community? How can we build up primary care? Just the previous answer were, how can we invest more in it with our GPs and making sure that frontline services are in communities, closer to people's homes? We know people want to stay at home instead of going into hospitals. So how can we do more of that? So I will be very, very serious about co-production, co-design, and that's going to be going in to consult right in the heart of communities in relation to any changes that we take forward. And I'd be very, very mindful of the needs of rural people whenever we're taking those decisions also. Mr Story, supplementary. Yeah, thank the Minister for her response. And she will also be aware, given the rural nature of my own constituents in North Antrim, from the Glens, Ballycastle, Rathlin, uh, and, and other locations within the constituency, how they want to have the confidence that in terms of the co-design, that there is a, a play with all the various elements of our health our professionals, particularly our GPs and our health service and our health centres. Does she see a pivotal role for those health centres, particularly given some of them have a very rural uh, nature? Minister. Yes, I, I do see a pivotal role for them. I think we also can be more innovative about how we can work in clusters. We can work, you know, a number of centres working together. I think if we have multidisciplinary teams and communities, that's all about investing in, in primary. And I, and I believe that people need to see that change in their communities before you can actually make all the bigger changes that are, that are going to need to happen as well. So um, I'm very committed to that. Um, I'm actually going to visit the members' constituency on Wednesday. I've got a whole range of engagements, which you, you may already be aware of. So um, I'm quite sure that the people of, of the area will, will make sure that their views are well, well known to me before I leave. Paul Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, earlier in questions, um, you provided a slight indication about the review of um, individual funding requests. Um, can I ask for maybe a bit more detail? You've mentioned that it will potentially be rolled out in 16-17. Are we talking about the start of the financial year from um, April time? Uh, because, as, as you are well aware, some of the people who are on the list, uh, list are waiting the outcomes. Please. Did you ask for the update on the the detail of when, what date the review, individual funding request review will come out. Minister. Yeah, I intend to try and announce the way forward before the end of this financial year. So we've been looking at, um, as I said earlier, the, pro the current process isn't transparent enough. People don't know how to access it properly. It seems to be quite problematic. So the whole review has looked at all that and how we can improve the process to make it more streamlined. So um, what I'm saying is I intend before the end of March to be able to bring forward the, the new process for what, how it's going to be developed for the next financial year. Supplementary, Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much. And how does the Minister envisage that the review of the Health and Wellbeing 2016 Delivering Together, currently being consulted upon, will take account of the needs of those um, who are in the stage of palliative stage of their, care, or their cancer? Minister. I think that when it comes to designing services, at the heart of Delivering Together is about designing services with patients, with staff, with carers. Um, so, in order to, whether it be palliative care, whether it be emergency care, whether it be GP care, we have to listen to those people who have lived experience, and I am very committed to that. And That is at the core of Delivering Together. We are going to design services with those people because they have that lived experience. They bring a whole new um, expertise to it, which has never been taken into account, I believe, fully in the past. So I think we have got a real opportunity here for people to be very bought in and understanding of, of how we deliver services. Quick question, Mr Trevor Lund, no guarantee of supplementary. 
Okay, th thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's likely under Brexit that the European Medicines Agency will be re relocated outside Great Brit Britain. Can the Minister advise what impact she thinks that will have on the life sciences industry in Northern Ireland? Minister. Yeah, um, you're, you're right, and I, I think that, um, well, indications or certainly individuals have told me that um, where it's relocated to means that a lot of the, the pharmacy companies also relocate in that area. So, yes, I think there will be implications. Um, I am aware that the Dublin government are, are um, engaged in some conversations around the potential of a coming to Ireland. So, I think there will be obviously knock on potential implications for us too. Order, uh, time is up. We now